afternoon. Anthony Farrell is my name. I'm the publisher of Lilliput Press. Um, and we, uh, well, we've long been part of the community in Stony Butter. I'm delighted to be part of its relatively recent um, festival. Proud to be here and to participate. Um, we arrived in 19, 1989, uh, in the winter of 1989, and I came up from my home in, in Westmeath. And Lilliput's been in existence since 1984. Um, I think we could claim three authors of genius um, who we've discovered, promoted, and published. The first would be Hewitt Butler, a Kilkenny essayist, who, who died in 1992 and became a, a household name, published internationally. Uh, the second of similar weight uh, was Tim Robinson, an English geographer who settled in the West Ireland. Um, and thirdly, we come to uh, a true and exceptional man, John Moriarty. Um, and we began with his book, Dreamtime, launched by uh, a local politician called Michael D. Higgins uh, in Clifton, at the Clifton Festival in 1994. Uh, same time as Riverdance, harnessing an extraordinary output of, of John Morality's subsequent works. We, we published eight volumes, I think, of his, of his writings over a period of 13 years before he died in 2007. And uh, it was a wonderful, rewarding relationship. Um, he was a, a, a carryman living in Connemara when I first met him. I met him through a local author and friend in Westmeath called Leo Daly, whose first novel I published called The Rock Garden. Um, and he told me about this extraordinary man in the West, and, and we went out to, to meet him. And he had this manuscript, Dreamtime, which he'd been working on for 15 years. So we followed each other up to Dublin, so to speak. Um, then we, we since. His, his passing, we've been sort of blessed with various interpretations and commentators uh, who've created books out of the books and adding their, uh, their, their, um, their take on it. Um, Aidan Carl Matthews would be one. Uh, more formally, Brendan O'Donoghue, who, who, who wrote The Moriarty Reader um, with scholarly annotation. Um, Mary McClickuddy, uh, who knew his family and background so well, uh, who wrote a wonderful anthology called Not the Whole Story. Um, Shauna Hearn and Michael Higgins, a relation, um, who wrote a book called Introducing Moriarty, but broadly for an American readership. And, and now we come to Martin Shaw and his anthology, A Hut, which, which we're celebrating in and through this festival. Um, Martin himself is a formidable writer and author with some half dozen books published in, in both the UK and the US. Um, he hails from, from the West Country in Devon, uh, where he is currently reader in poetics at the Dartington Arts School. Um, and there he founded both the oral tradition and mythic life courses. He, his collection of Celtic stories and poems is called Cinder Biter, and that was published in 2020 by Grey Wolf Press, a very distinguished literary imprint. And his more recent works include Courting the Wild Twin, The Night Wages, Wolf Milk, and Smoke Hole, all published in 2020. Um, he's, he's also a delightful artist, and his drawings um, form headpieces to the themed selections of, of this present book. So, so we're, we're honoured in having him and uh, welcome Martin and the festival. Um, one of my friends, who's a, a great Moriarty devotee, he's, he's a painter called Anthony Murphy, he lives in the south of France, um, has read dream time to bits really and every time he comes to stay which is about once a year although not in the last year obviously <laughs> he 
he um he says to me why don't you put moriarty's sayings up on the wall and uh, several years ago he he uh there's a very ugly concrete rubble wall here we we splashed up in white paint uh one of his sayings from dreamtime which was walk naked to tara and inherit your royalty because stony Bader is on the it means the the old road or the, the stony road is on is one of the great roads to tara one of the great branching five roads that mm. comes into, into viking dublin <laughs> and um so we had this up there for a week or two um it was a tourist attraction many people photographed it and um somebody on on some anonymous person objected to it hinting that it was obscene i think <laughs> and um so it was taken down steamed off by dublin council of course Anthony was visiting again and he put it up again and it lasted an even shorter time about two weeks and we, we've rather given up on that but um it says something about the power of his message I think um mm -hmm. it was greatly loved by most people and su um suspected by others <laughs> so um we John used to come here a lot and um, this is where his his work works were birthed, so to speak. Um, and you have your own sort of origin myth story. <laughs> How did you discover? I know you were transported by the book. You were on British Rail, but you had a different type of transport. And you were I, making a long journey, which is yeah. still continuing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It is continuing. Nice to be talking with you, Anthony. There aren't, I, I don't think there's a huge amount yet, although this may be about to change, a huge amount of English Moriarty readers. There's a few. Yes. Yeah. Somehow I'd ended up with a copy of Dreamtime. This would have been a decade ago. And I was catching a train from Totnes in Devon all the way up to Norwich in East Anglia, which is a, it's a fair old hike and was going to involve negotiating London at Christmas, getting off at Paddington, getting over to probably Liverpool Street and then on. And all I can remember is around Exeter opening the book. And gave it? So I, can't, I can't recall. I can't recall. This is one of the, it's either, <laughs> it's either brain fog or some <laughs> sort of mildly miraculous event, but I can't remember how I got the book in my hand. But I was suddenly aware that seven hours had passed. I hadn't, I had no real memory of moving through London. I couldn't remember the tube. I couldn't remember the stairs. All I could, all I knew was that I had been well and truly claimed by this extraordinary book. Now, my background is in mythologist. I'm this rare endangered species called a mythologist. Mm. So Moriarty's incredible dexterity when it comes to a knowledge of, for example, is um, uh, Indian, you know, the Vedas through to the, you know, the Upanishads through to Beowulf through to Black Elk, that kind mm. of agility is dazzling, but I recognized quickly what he was doing. But what is so unique about John for me, Moriarty's work, is that on the one hand, he has that kind of almost universal ability to dive deep wherever he goes. But at the other, he really remains rooted in Kerry. He remains utterly localized. And mm. that combination of, in, of intense depth and great diversity of growth was pretty dazzling to me. Uh, like everybody else, he he threatens your erudition at first and you realize you've got a bit of reading to do and a bit of thinking to do and a bit mm, of brooding mm. to do but what's been so wonderful for me is in the last 10 years every now and then I'll be working with a group of students both here and in the states and I'll talk about John and we'll just work into one or two of his ideas and freed from that initial overwhelming experience of trying to read his great canon which I would suggest for most people do it incrementally bit by bit mm -hmm. the students jumped into the great wrestle you have in any good Moriarty text and loved it and I suddenly realized that we were talking about someone with 
an extraordinary ecological message a little bit ahead of his time probably behind his time and ahead of his time yeah and so you and i met didn't we about 18 months ago yes, and that, I think, oh, you and tommy ten go yeah yes and i think almost instantly there was the possibility between us of something like this happened but uh, happening but it's to you and lily puts eternal credit that about a year ago we said okay let's, let's do, do it, it. Yeah. let's try and get it out on his uh you know on on the the month of his death and we pulled it yeah. off and then on that note i got a very sweet email from two very important people in moriarty's life so to speak um one is mary mcclicuddy um yeah. who was the, the teacher uh, the the uh, the te the principal at, at the school John attended St Michael's, um, and um, and she and, uh, and she refers to Amanda. Amanda is John's sort of nearest living relative, his niece. And I, this email came through, which I think I passed on to, you, and it warmed my heart. And it said, "We, Amanda and I, think you have published and Martin Shaw has written a most beautiful book. It has lifted our hearts today." And we have just completed a shared reading of the introduction and the beautiful ending. Appreciated the cover and the little drawings and found a marvelous understanding of and love for John's work. The singing and the song lines are all there and Martin Shaw is singing with him. Please convey our thanks to him and thank you for keeping this amazing legacy alive. I couldn't have had a, we couldn't have had a better tribute from no. the people who, who knew him at the bottom of their hearts. And uh, that that pleased me mightily. And I, I think it did you too. Yeah. Um, on the subject of books, which we're surrounded by, um, books are famously built from books. And, and for, for John, he talks about the impact that the origin of species had in, in sort of opening a door into the unknown for him and challenging his, his Christian perceptions in a way that Mr. Poots would never allow. <laughs> um, did any such text play a role in your evolution, of the evolution of your thought? It, was there any extraordinary book or, or series of books that oh, um, tilted your universe? I, I mean, in, in a, li a little, there's a very famous photograph, isn't there? Well, it's famous amongst Moriarty fans of John in his front room, surrounded by piles of books. Absolutely. Piles. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> yeah, at the, at the end, at the end of this, I described them as his Stonehenge, his Eros. Yes, you have a beautiful it, passage. Well, it yeah. was, it was a feeling, one of the things that is attractive to me in John's work is a kind of introversion that I can detect. And like a lot of people, uh, I'm not remotely unique in this. That's something I experience in myself, even though I managed to occasionally channel it into a civic and public life. Mm. So like, like Moriarty, there would be almost too many bedrock texts to mention. Although thinking geographically for a moment, thinking in terms of place, like I was talking about John and Kerry, I'm talking to you from a Devon cottage now. Yeah, yeah. In in 18 miles in that direction is the village of North Torton, where Ted Hughes wrote Crow and all his great mm. Mm. Work. Ten miles in that direction is the village of Galton outside Brixham, where Robert Graves wrote the first iteration of The White Goddess when it was called oh. The Roebuck in the Thicket. So yes. I'm caught in the energetic familial line of mm. Graves and Hughes. So I think, because of course, like anybody, I could pick so many, I would probably say that in a my sense of a Devonian lineage comes out of those two writers. And you reminded me, didn't you, of a strange conversation you'd had where John said that he'd known Ted. He'd met him, yes, he babysat for him. That was it. He was, yeah. With his uh, second or third wife in Devon, I think, well, unless it was London, but it's during his English period. Extraordinary, yes. And then he revered Hughes, yeah. Mm. One of the other things, when I started to do the serious reading that I knew 
the book was going to take. One of the things that assisted me is that I, I grew up in a theological house. Uh, my dad and my brother are preachers. My sister uh, mm. have seven children and, yeah. uh, you know, in her Catholic household. There, there was a, there was a. Where did you come in the hierarchy? Were you? In I'm the old. I'm the oldest. Oh, you're the senior. Okay. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the senior. Then I have a younger yep. brother, Tom, who oh. has a church in San Francisco, and my sister Anna oh. and her family, who are based in, are based in Norfolk, actually. So I, the thing that was so extraordinary about Moriarty is, on the one hand, he's digging into a kind of Christianity we barely have the words for yet. And at the same time, he's so porous as a thinker, he mm. keeps bringing in other faiths, other philosophies under this wide, extraordinary kind of Christianity that he's beginning to blow on the embers of. Yeah, I, haven't, yeah. I, haven't come, I haven't come across that yet ever so successfully done. Mm. And, of course, what's so hard is that just as we remember, he was saying, OK, a hedge school for Kerry, he realises that he's at the end of his life. Yeah. And he wrote that wonderful little book as a sort of farewell called Serious Sounds, where he really reverted to his earliest faith, I think. Yeah. Quoting, quoting the Philip Larkin. Yeah. Uh, going. Yeah. Um, can I address something else, which is, I've just called it the difficulty question. Um, looking at the Irish Times review of your book, which came out, which was headlined, Is Ours an Utterly Deviant Planet? It was by the, the sort of in-house philosopher there called Joe Humphreys. I'll just quote briefly. He says, don't mistake the book for a tribute act. It's a work that cries out for attention Moriarty's plea for an urgent stillness, a fracturing of space-time to allow nature to breathe and give us a chance of emotional rebirth. It's very good, this. Um, it's just what a pollutant species of unhappy mammals needs to hear. He then goes on, the book is not an easy read. As much as half of it went over my head, as Moriarty's <laughs> mental gymnastics tumbles him from Norse folklore to Hindu mysticism, vaulting over obscure biblical references and Nietzschean insights to draw out some uncertain points. But when his words land, they do so with force. Now, this comes up often, the difficulty question, the struggle, you know, the, the neologisms. Um, we, we, uh, at the end of his books, we, we, do, we are quite careful to, to um, give a glossary for, for, the, for the more obscure terms. Um, which John himself just dictated off, off the top of his head, <laughs> and I transcribed. Um, and that there are sort of Joycean immensities here. Um, and, but I think that Moriarty gives us the tools of understanding with the language that he uses. And it, it's, it's unlike, you know, the, the uh, true opacities of, of the best-selling Mr. Hawkins, whose brief history of time was a bestseller, but was, I think, rarely read. Um, mm. um, I, I'd, su you know, su suggest that John um, prompts his own readers. He provides his readers with, with the tools to, to interpret him. And I think the, the, that struggle is, is part of the, the joy of the understanding that readers arrive at. Mm. Um, and what did what difficulties did you have over that opacity of language, that veil, as it were? Well, as as Bob Dylan says, it's that's my cup of meat. It's the kind of world that <laughs> I live in and enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, it was a major task to do the kind of reading required to sift through thematically, and I had no sense of what the themes would be, other than a general kind of divine ground until mm. I went deeper. Uh, the wonderful thing is Moriarty can't really be franchised. He's not very good as a hashtag. You can't really pin down a gleaming uh, match fit form of mm. Celtic Christianity from it. It's this, it's this rumbling atmosphere 
rather than an A to a B to a C. And to be honest, you either like that kind of thing or you just don't. Mm. And uh, I realized the one the one thing that felt important with a hut at the edge of the village was to begin with a sense of where he came from, a sense of his childhood, and then move from those incredible local stories that he tells, you know, or, or mm. when I say local, I mean place-based, the story of Big Mike, that incredible night when he walks back from the pub with Martin. Yeah, uh, so and, and then gradually, if you can if you can chew on that if you can you know keep that in in your the meat hall of your jaw then possibly the bigger and the growingly wilder ecological thinking that he does comes at you it's not quite so much a shock but for me that's part of the radical urgency of what john is doing i think both of us know that a, a book like this as as actually that review accurately said this is not a nostalgic experience he's not a very comfortable mm. writer mm. we think you know uh we think of course of uh john o'donoghue writing at a similar point in time and amkara a very nifty book a book that makes you feel good filled with wit uh filled with spiritual wisdom John, but John's stuff for me has a totally different kind of purchase. It oh, troubles yeah, yeah. the soul yeah. into communication. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, he had sort of radiant powers of observation, especially writing about the material world he inhabited and, and, and nature, so called. Um, I'm just the beginning of Curlew, for example. Um, I'll just read the first three paragraphs. Um, now again, I live in a mirrored, a river mirrored house. This is in Tungola, in Connemara. A house, a cottage, and the river that mirrors it, broadening out twice a day into an estuary lake, fished by otters and herons, and when the salmon are running, by a sole old seal. One of the herons I know, screeching and croaking an Angelus that announces only himself, he comes in flying low over the water, and the rhetoric of his wing folding perfect, he stands there, outstandingly, poised for the kill. Young though he is in, his li in this lifetime, he is old in incarnations. Wonderful. And there is sort of the particular and the universal just captured in, in one extraordinary image. And, and this think, shines through his writings. Yeah, it, it, it is extraordinary. i tell you what I'll do. As you're reading a bit... I'll read oh, a bit. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So this is this is you know for I'm very aware that most people watching this won't have, probably have a clue who I am, but a lot of my life over the last 25 years has been as a oral storyteller, stand and deliver. Oh, thank thank you for. Well, here are your wonderful books. Bless Martin. you. Um, <laughs> I I'm, I'm pleased to see my little friends. Courting the wild twins. Yes. Beautifully produced. Um, in America by Chelsea Green. Yes, thank you. Handsome book, yeah. Yeah, Sorry. And, and it's all right, don't worry. But uh, what I want to read, this is John digging into an old Irish myth, and you can hear the orality in the way that mm. he writes. When you hear the Lilliput recordings of John, it's astonishing because there aren't that many writers that have the same oral rhythm as they mm. do on the page. He does. Anyway, this is... This is a Do bit... you read? Are your is your are your works available on on CD or tape or whatever? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Uh, Sorry, he's uh, it's, uh, it's on Audible and and all of that kind of thing. And I okay. have a website, okay. Systemistica, plenty of audio, okay, uh, good audio stuff. Here we go. Other boys had an ancestry. I had a pedigree, and my pedigree meant it was mostly through dreaming that I would know and deal. With reality overflowing all inner and outer banks dreaming would sometimes be an inundation an outcrop of waking nowhere in sight even when he was near me talking to me my father was far away in bird form among birds their underwings raucously red that's how i would remember him my mother looked after a king's cattle. She had cures, 
and she crossed into other worlds as easily as someone who had slept all night crosses into waking. Sometimes a long sojourn in another world would fall between the two parts of a conversation I'd have with her. That is some great writing. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it, 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 it's spacious, unhurried, and great storytelling. Yeah. Uh, and from originally, you know, your book Invoking Ireland. Um, so I just, I fell in love with the language. I fell in love with the difficulty. I fell in love with the wrestle. But I did feel the one thing that possibly I could add to this great Moriarty and conversation is try and open a door. And this is very much part of what mm. you and I were talking about to an audience mm. that maybe simply wouldn't bang into him. Maybe they're not in Ireland. Maybe they're in the States. Maybe they're younger because. Well, this is I, your fellow. It's wonderful. Yeah. You're passing the torch. Yeah. Yeah. Really trying to do that because uh, I think a Moriarty and consciousness is a very good idea. And I just mm. say this one thing. When you're presented with his canon and you open up the books, it can be a bit overwhelming, but actually some of his essential ideas are digestible. They really are digestible because, mm. as you said, Anthony, he provides you with the tools to unpack it. Mm. Moriarty is doing what William Blake did before him and the Rhineland mystics did before him. And, um, you know, all, all sorts of visionary characters. And it's this, if you just spend your life looking at the world, you risk burnout. If you can behold the world, everything changes. I, mm. I've said this mm. a million times, I'm walking through London and I see a thistle. William Blake walking by me sees a little gray man waving at him. John mm. would see the little gray man too. Mm. Uh, and that for me is why I felt I wanted to do this work. When you're in the middle of your own work as a writer, to take effectively a year out to devote your labours to someone else has to be an act of love. It has to yeah. be in respect. Otherwise, you simply wouldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> but I was I was edified by this. Do you remember the situation we ended up in, Anthony, where we realised that quite a lot, quite a lot of the texts we wanted to get to hadn't been digital. They weren't digital. Yeah, yeah free digital. I, just, I sat there <laughs> through the winter, and of course, there was an option of of paying someone to do that. But I, yeah. I took it like a metaphysical task. Well, no, it wasn't a metaphysical task. It was a very real one. But I thought, yeah. I'll get to know John in a different way if I type mm. this out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, yeah, like a little Lindisfarne monk, I scribed away and feel the better for it. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. I mean, you've achieved a, a, a terrific distillation. Um, I mean, we published, I think, eight books by John in his lifetime over... Of the lifetime I knew him in over 13 years. Um, this is what the 14th anniversary of his death. But um, and then we we did you know another three anthologies or readers. I mean yours is the fourth in line, and I think by far the most distinguished. Um, we we began with Brendan O'Donoghue's Moriarty Reader, um, preparing for early spring, which is quite an academic. It contains about 10 percent of all of his writings. Um, with very deft introductions. Then we, we had Mary McGillicuddy's Not the Whole Story, because she knew his family. She'd never met John, oddly, <laughs> but she knew his family so well, his brothers and his, his cousins and, and the whole Kerry, yeah. Um, and then we had M Michael uh, Michael Higgins and John Ahern, um, who come at it from a, a sort of more orthodox religious angle called Introducing Moriarty in His Own Words. Um, but you know, was selection for you an issue as you sort of swam through <laughs> these eight books? Um, and, and you know, the depth of reading, the worlds of knowledge that John draws upon are unparalleled. Um, yeah, they are, they are, and I'm sure you brought your own divination into that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I. I I, I'm I'm eclectic and relatively learned in some of the areas mm. where I have no knowledge is mm. uh, uh, Buddhism, 
for example. Yeah. Now, John, John doesn't really go near Islam. Not really. No. He, he, he skirts around Sufism. Yes. But, yeah. but still, um, there were areas, you know, uh, the, the Indian material, the Buddhist material, which I love, but in my own life, I have to, I, I've long befriended the goddess of limit, and I mm. limit like a horse mm. what I'm going to be exposed to. John it has an astonishingly vast navigational view. I don't have that in my own work. I'm looking for something a little different. But I think probably the fact that I hadn't come across John when I was young, the fact that I'd already written several books, the mm. fact that I was deep into my own material helped. Gave you confidence. Because yeah. it, gave, it gave me a little bit of observational distance. And secondly, I knew what it felt like to actually teach some of John's ideas in a group full of people who were maybe struggling with it. So that gave me a little clue about what may be most useful in terms of the yeah. section. Yeah, no, fascinating. John, John's own faith, Martin. Um, to me, you know, he, he was pre-Christian. He had this sort of deep pagan element in, in his perception of the world. Uh, uh, what used to be called animism, I think, where mm. matter and organic life had soul. I mean, it's now come back into, into view with people's views of trees and so forth. And uh, um, the, the, the sort of sacral nature of, of, um, of the fragile earth that... that people are now hugely aware of um what what do you think his um do you think in that in this way he, he is prescient that he, he talks to our and future generations i mean that that without making too much of a of a, a thing of it but I, I think that's what makes him appeal to to the next generation of readers um yeah. when they look around them as what's going on out there we know, I think most people have got the, got the gist that we are in the most dreadful times ecologically. Mm. John knew that and infused his books with it, but he took the road of beauty rather than the road of statistics and neurosis. Yeah. And that, I feel, is incredibly important if you're going to have a life with a degree of consciousness in it. If you keep staring at catastrophe unaided by art, unaided mm. by beauty, unaided by what we call divinity, you risk yeah. burning up very quick. You think of the Greek myths, when you're confronted by a beast of some kind, if you look at them head on, it's over. But if you catch their reflection on a shield, mm. you can see the horror, but you have this navigational tool. Mm. And I think actually in the end for me, after so long reading John's work, He's telling us to pay attention to the slow, steady, sometimes seemingly undramatic walk of our own lives. He's petitioning mm. us to stay interested and stay curious into the family we grew into, the jobs mm. that we've had, the love affairs we've been wrecked by. And actually that in itself is divine ground. You don't need to gobble ayahuasca all day long. You don't necessarily... <laughs> Well, I mean, he's always saying it would be a good idea to walk backwards across China, you know, which is great. <laughs> but he's saying you can also do it uh, in Gort. Mm, you, can, mm. you can have that consciousness outside the foot clinic in Gort at midnight, as I once yeah. sat drinking Pachin, actually, when we just decided <laughs> to do this. Yeah. It's, it's, and I have to say one thing else, Anthony. It's particularly important to me because the geographic region the west of ireland is the most extraordinary place and as a story to terrain. yeah long long before i found john's work i'd been telling those stories really since words popped out of my mouth you know mm. and and it's it's where a lot of my blood comes from yeah so, as you <laughs> yeah so as you're, I, you're a mayo man at heart <laughs> well as i as i approach i'm 50 in october and yeah. this, this is the beginning of me trying to do good 
service and good work to a country mm. that I care very much about. Yeah, yeah. That's, I really feel that. No, it's great that, you know, to have a, a younger, I'm 70 now, so to have another younger keeper of the flame, Martin. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate that. And whoever's, uh, there'll be people listening to this that knew John well, and I didn't. Uh, but I hope, and I also want to, I want to give libation and in, to encourage, if you like A Hut at the Edge of the Village, get the other books. Lily puts yeah. have a whole quiver of them, you know. Um, sounds, be, yeah, yeah. Be, be fiscally bankrupt for a while and spiritually uh, replete. Yeah, there they are. There they are. The beginning and the end. You know, Dreamtime, yeah. such a wonderful, it was launched by Michael D. Higgins before he became president. And um, we were pushing people out the door. I think we sold 500 copies. Such was the expectation. Oh, nice. That everybody knew he was brewing this book. And, and then, you know, we managed to get to that. I think um, we should probably wrap, and, um, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> and, um, and thank you, you, you um, for announcing him to a, a new generation and a... A, a wide, you know, a wider diaspora, and I think, I think the world, the word will continue spreading. And a, an, an absolute pleasure, and I look forward very much to being over in Ireland with you, and hopefully making you friends and talking about John and his work yep. soon. <laughs> okay, Martin. Okay, good to see you and hey, bye. Thank you very much, Anthony Martin, and the Stony Better Festival for hosting this event. Um. A Hut at the Edge of the Village, which is edited by Martin Shaw, is available now from Lilliput, in-store, online, bookshops, and anywhere books are sold. Um, yeah, thanks once again to Stony Butter. Thank you guys for tuning in, and hopefully we'll see you soon. <laughs>